Father, you worked your will. I had no righteousness of my own. I had no right to draw near your throne. Father, you love me still. And in love before you lay the world's foundation, you predestined to adopt me as your own.
the sting of the fire You can have a seat for just a moment. Good morning, 121. My name is Jehuda. It's not up to this time. I won't hold that against you guys. Um, I'm here to, oh, there it is. Uh, I'm here to ex- kind of explain baptism. Uh, I've been here for five years. I also have the privilege of leading the young men's life group here. Um, and baptism uh, means to be submerged. It also carries that. Uh, kind of meaning of being washed. Uh, it's important to us because it, it symbolizes very powerful, true realities for us. One of them is Jesus Christ's death, burial, and resurrection. Another one is the washing away of our sins through what Christ did on that cross. And then lastly is the dying of ourselves to our own sin and being resurrected with Jesus. Uh, Romans tells us to rejoice with those who rejoice and to weep with those who weep. And I just want to invite you guys today to just rejoice at the fact that another brother and sister are taking a step in boldness and following a command given to us by Jesus. Love you guys. All right. Well, we, as, as Jehuda said, we get to celebrate baptism today uh, for two people, uh, both part of the, the Wonger family. So first we have uh, Evelina. So Evelina said that uh, when mom, her mom was reading an Easter devotional, Uh, She asked just a lot of questions, and uh, during that time, her mom explained salvation, what that meant, and why she needed Jesus. Um, And then over over time, as they had those just continuous conversations about these things, uh, there was one particular song that that she was learning over and over again uh, in six different languages. Uh, She's pretty advanced in that way. Uh, It was about John 3.16. And in learning that song, she she really started to to ask questions about what does it mean? What what does that uh, sacrifice mean? What does that look like? And so it gave her mom just a lot of, Christine, a lot of opportunities to to explain what that meant and and for her to really internalize 
what that meant for Jesus to die for her sins. Uh, and so, and then in the midst of that, her life group uh, has, within, in kids has been just really walking alongside her and, and really had some great conversations and been a great part of, uh, of this journey. Um, so, so Evelina trusted Jesus. And, and then she says, she says this now, she says that about Jesus, that he helps me in all areas when I go to him in prayer. He comforts me when things are not going well. I know there will always be struggles, but if I just pray to Jesus, he will help me because he cares about me. And I love singing worship songs, especially that, John, that song about John 3.16 in six languages. So she wants to get baptized today to show others that she is a Christian and wants to follow Jesus. So her, her parents, uh, John and Christine, are going to baptize her now. and sisters in Christ, to now baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. All right, and then next we have uh, her older brother, John. So for John, uh, he uh, was searching for, so very similar story. Uh, it was an Easter again. So searching for Easter eggs and mom read a devotional about Easter that just raised a lot of questions about what it meant to live for Jesus. So mom answered all those questions and shared the good news with him about uh, Jesus and how he could follow him. Follow him. And, and then he prayed to Jesus and, and put his trust in, in Jesus. Um, he says this, he says, following Jesus makes me a better person. I felt more joyful. He gives me self-control to calm me down in rough times. And he prays a lot, especially at bedtime, to get himself to sleep. And he says that he wants to be baptized because it's to show the world that he is a Christian and a follower of Jesus. And John, once again, it's our privilege as your earthly father and mother and our honor as your brother and sister in Christ to baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. All right, well, we are celebrating out here, and we are ready to continue to worship our Lord. I was buried beneath my shame Who could carry that kind away? It was my turn Till I met Failures I tried to hide It was my time Till I met you You called my name
Amen. You can have a seat for one more moment. Right. Welcome to 121. I'm glad to worship with you this morning. Uh, our names are John, Ashley, and Luke Pfeiffer, and we are currently serving as global workers in Cambodia. We have been there for eight years now and have been members of 121 since 2005. Uh, we love our, our country we serve in. Uh, we serve at two of the international Christian schools there, um, serving, John serves at Hope, which is a missionary school, serves missionary students, and I serve at a, a com Combination. Half of the, uh, the student body is Buddhist and half of them are Christian. So we serve with those. And then our son Luke will be in eighth grade this year. He's been going there since kindergarten, so eight years now. Um, we are just so thankful to be a part of a body of believers that really pours into global workers, both through prayer through uh, supporting us financially, and through our A-team. Our A-team is absolutely phenomenal about praying, reaching out to us, sending us packages, sending us little text messages, um, saying that they're praying for us, sending us packages of things that we uh, miss here in America. And, but we're here this summer just um, getting some rest, much-needed rest. Um, some green spaces are much-needed for us. Um, Cambodia is very very dusty and dirty, so we love being in green area. And so our son Luke is going to greet you in Khmer, which is the local language of the Cambodian people. So Luke has been. <laughs> Luke has been studying Khmer uh, three days a week at school um, since kindergarten, so he is much more fluent and can write and read Khmer better than John and I could ever imagine. Um, but we are so thankful for the church's partnership for us, and we love um, our A-team and just all the people that pray for us and support us, send us emails um, throughout the years. And so we'll go back at the end of July for another two years and be back two years later for another little for a low summer break. All right, our verse for today is Acts 7, 54 through 60. Now when they heard this, they were cut to the quick, and they began gnashing their teeth at him. But being full of the Holy Spirit, he gazed intently into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. And he said, Behold, I see the heavens opened up and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. But they cried out in a loud voice and covered their ears and rushed at him with one impulse. When they had driven him out of the city, they began stoning him, and the witnesses laid aside their robes at the feet of a young man named Saul. They went on stoning Stephen as he called on the Lord and said, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then falling on his knees, he cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. Having said this, he fell asleep. Let's pray. Dear God, thank you for this day. Thank you for this opportunity for us to gather here uh, and worship you and praise you. Thank you for this church and the opportunities that it provides for the global workers around the country and around the world. Thank you for the A-teams and for all the support that's provided to them. Let's bless this day and enjoy the rest of our worship here. In your name, amen.
Broken heart and light my way until my time on earth is done. Oh, Holy Spirit, breathe in me like kingdom come. No, oh, Holy Spirit, let your word. In me says we can't help but do it when the spirit of the Lord comes upon us. Amen. Good to gather together and to be able to sing, and <clears throat> I don't know about you, but it just enriches my heart, and uh, just to be able to sing, uh, it sings my soul, how great is your love, just to let that rest on us today, uh, the love and the grace of God. Uh, I wanted to just share a couple of things with you by way of uh, ways to pray. Uh, the last couple of weeks, uh, we've had uh, just really cool things here with our kids, uh, with Active Junior. Uh, two weeks ago, and then our active kids camp this last week, so with our preschoolers, our children, many of your kids have participated and uh, focused on the armor of God, and, uh, and I love that that was the focus uh, for our kids. Uh, it's uh, a challenge uh, out there, so the, the armor of God's not for when we just get older, uh, and so I love that that's what has been our focus. This is what I ask you to pray for our kids. 
uh, that God would seal in them what it is that he taught them these last couple of weeks. Uh, That it wouldn't just be a camp and move on uh, or activity and move on, but the truths of God that were implanted in them, that they would be sealed in them. And then if you'd pray also tonight, we have 180 plus uh, headed off to youth camp. Uh, Our middle school and high schoolers, they'll be headed to Estes Park, Colorado. So fun all night ride and then off and running. Uh, And just pray that God will meet them. Uh, Sometimes we hear people talk about camps and weekends and they get these spiritual highs and then they come off of those highs. And, And I would just say pray they would have a spiritual high. I mean, goodness, how many times do we actually get away for a few days and actually get out of the distractions and be able to focus on God himself uh, and the teachings from the scripture. We would expect uh, that there would be highs. And what I would always say as a youth minister, and this is the way I pray, that we're on this long journey. I don't know how long it is for each of us. God has our days numbered. But whatever that is, and and I think it's a a steady path that we run on for a little bit. And then we have moments like camps or like active and that kind of thing. And it's a high. We kind of head up the mountain a little bit. And my prayer is that when we come off that mountain, we come off a little bit higher than we were when we went up it. And if you do that enough times over the course of a lifetime, if you started here, you're way up here on just a steady path with some occasional hits where you're thinking, oh, wow, I can't believe God just met us like that. Uh, so would you pray that our students would be met, uh, that he'd take them as high as God, as, that they'd go as high as God wants them to go, uh, and then when they start to come down a little bit, they'd steady out uh, a little bit higher in their walk with the Lord than before. And then we have a group headed this week. Uh, to the Czech Republic uh, on mission. Uh, They'll be doing a city camp. We partner with Young Life in the Czech Republic. Uh, And then I believe uh, they'll be, have some opportunity with some Ukrainian refugee kids uh, as well. So if you could pray uh, for our team that's headed out. As a norm, I do not ask you personal things to pray for our family. Uh, We're we're pretty high maintenance. If I'd, I'd have something every week, I think, if I... Uh, if I did. And we certainly had season uh, where I've asked you quite a bit. But uh, this past week, uh, Lisa and I had a bike accident and uh, she broke her kneecap, uh, among other things. And uh, and so that should require surgery this week. And we just ask you to pray against infection uh, on things with her and then uh, that we'll be in the right spot and that could be done quickly. Uh, and healing for her. So we're, we're so appreciative of our church family. People have been fantastic towards us, and, um, and I just, we just wanted to ask you to pray for us this, this week. So thank you for that. I know everybody has different things going on, and uh, we love to be able to walk with you, and we're grateful that you walk with us uh, as well. So thank you for that. Well, I want us to think about uh, from Acts chapter 7 um, that was read earlier uh, about forgiveness today. Forgiveness can be incredibly freeing uh, when we offer and give it towards those who have hurt us, Uh, and it can be awfully difficult uh, to forgive people who have hurt us. It can be difficult to forgive people who hurt someone that we love, Uh, and sometimes uh, we have trouble offering forgiveness to people with names as well as to groups of people in different ideologies that are out there. And the reality is, if we fail to forgive and we linger in unforgiveness, that unforgiveness will quickly turn to bitterness and resentment. And we actually imprison our own souls with that bitterness and resentment that flows from unforgiveness. It becomes more difficult to sing a song like, Then Sings My Soul, and to sing it with joy and to sing it with zeal of how great God's love is when we're holding something against someone else. It's difficult enough to forgive people we love that hurt us. And it's way more difficult to forgive difficult people in our lives. And that's actually where I want us to hang out based on the Scripture. So we, we're just letting the Scripture teach us and, and take us where God wants us to go. And, and so I want us to think about the, the big idea in Acts chapter 7, beginning verse 54, and, and uh, to the end of the chapter. And then I'll do a quick summary of chapter 8, uh, verses 1 through 3. But I want us to think about forgiving the most difficult people. How, for example, would... 
a family whose child was gunned down in Uvalde a few weeks ago, how do they ever forgive the gunman? How do generations of Cambodians ever forgive Pol Pot and the millions that were slaughtered in Cambodia? How do those who are related or know Jewish people that were killed in the Holocaust forgive their killers? On a more personal level, how, how do you forgive someone that has personally abused you emotionally, spiritually, sexually, physically? It's difficult to forgive when we've been hurt deeply. How do our Christian brothers and sisters in Ukraine forgive Putin and the Russian military that just in a matter of months have wiped out their whole way of life? Just like that. How? How do you forgive that? When we come to this part of the scripture, uh, I believe Stephen gives us an excellent model of how to forgive the most difficult people. So I'd like for us to just think about this in different parts. Uh, before we get to it, I want to recap chapter 6 and 7 because we've looked at the life of Stephen in these two chapters. And here we see the end of his life at the end of chapter 7. It's a pretty brief bio uh, of him. But Stephen is a man that is described as full of faith, full of power, full of wisdom, full of the Holy Spirit. He was one of seven that were chosen to serve and wait tables. And it seems he also was one who preached the word of God and, uh, because he drew up the ire of those who were around him uh, because of the message that he preached. In chapter 6, as it continues, then the Sanhedrin, the religious people of the day, the rulers of the day, they didn't uh, like what Stephen was saying, so they drum up false charges against him, and now Stephen is facing this council of people, and then if you were here last week, you heard Jermaine preach through chapter 7, the majority of it, and what Stephen does, it's brilliant, they're coming against him, he just simply shares the story of God. He just says, hey, look, this is from the beginning what God has been doing. The story is about God, and it's, that's who we're talking about here. Uh, and he just lays it out. Now, he lays out that story, and then he does something interesting. It's not an evangelism technique that we teach here, although maybe we should. Because at the end of it, he shares it, and then he looks them right in the eye, and he says, you're a bunch of stiff-necked people. Resisting the Holy Spirit of God. And you're no different than the murderers and betrayers of the ones who came before you against the prophets of the righteous one, Jesus, who's to come. I mean, have you ever done that? Like you're sharing the gospel with somebody? You might be thinking, I don't know if I've ever really shared God's story with somebody. That would be cool to do that. But just think about getting to the end of it. Look in the person in the eye and say, you're really a stubborn, hard stiff-necked person, and you keep resisting God. Some people need to hear that. I did a wedding the other night, and the couple wanted me to share the gospel with the people who were there, and, and I did. And the, the, the person I was doing the wedding for, he challenges people. And so I just said to the group that was there, 230 people, I said, I just want to challenge you just like the groom would. You're a bunch of highly successful people, and it's like this room. There's a lot of highly successful people here. You're used to being challenged. You don't succeed if you don't get challenged. So it actually might be good for us to pray and ask God, are there some people I need to look in the eye today and just say, you know what? You've really gotten stubborn and hard-hearted towards God. We just need to say that out loud today. And I can't change your heart, but if we can just own today that you're hard-hearted and stubborn and stiff-necked, 
Man, that's probably a good step because we can just acknowledge what the heart is like and beg God to break it and soften it. So that brings us to where we are. Now, some people respond well to that. Some people don't like that so much. Stephen runs into a crowd that's not too happy about that challenge. Let's pick up in verse 54. And the first thing I would say, just for outline perspective, is that we're going to forgive the most difficult people. Uh, It's those who are mad at us. Verse 54. Now, when they heard this, they heard what Stephen said, they were cut to the quick and they began gnashing their teeth at him. So they heard Stephen out. They heard what he said is challenge to them at the end, and they were cut to the quick. Now, one of the beauties of working through a book of the Bible is we start to see patterns of things that are said. So we go back to Acts chapter 2, verse 37. Peter had just done what Stephen did, preached an amazing message, laid out the story of God, fixated on Jesus being crucified and risen. And the scripture says in verse 37, chapter 2, they were pierced to the heart. Same idea as cut to the quick. It means their their heart was just kind of split wide open. But it's interesting because in chapter 2, they were pierced and cut to the quick. And they said, what do we do? They heard it and they realized they were stubborn and rebellious against God. So what do we do about that? And Peter said, repent. Then get baptized, just like we just witnessed. And 3,000 people that day repented. But just a few chapters later, just a few more days into the story of what God's doing in the early church, and this group isn't split open at the heart and saying, what do I do here? They're mad about it. They're just flat mad. They gnash their teeth at him, which means there was a fierce anger in them. Who are those that are mad at us today? It's just the Christian community. Our culture has grown increasingly hostile towards Christians. And if you claim the name of Christ, that that would mean all of us that claim that name, there's an increasing hostility against us. George Yancey is a sociology professor at Baylor University. And this was written in an article in 2019, the Gospel Coalition. I want you to keep in mind, this is three years ago. And I've got to believe this has only amped up in the last three years. So he did a survey. As a sociologist, he did a survey on people's attitudes towards American Christians. And he, four responses that he received among many... One, kill them all. Let their gods sort them out. Two, torturous death would be too good for them. Three, I'd be a bit giddy, certainly grateful, if everyone who saw himself or herself as a Christian were permanently snatched from our societal peripheries, whether by holocaust or rapture or plague. Four, I'm only too well aware of the Christian's horrific attitudes and beliefs, and these are enough to make me see them as subhuman. This is a Baylor professor's survey of people's attitudes towards American Christians. This isn't overseas somewhere. It's not something you watch on the news that's overseas. This will be us that they're referring to. Now, how do you walk in a posture of forgiveness towards people who are mad at us like that? Well, Peter or Stephen gives us uh, a pathway to it. Verse 55 and 56, uh, I would say the first thing he gives us a, a model for is to gaze on God's glory. Now, I don't want you to get lost in thinking that's too lofty. I would say this is actually crucial to the whole forgiveness part. Now, sometimes what people enjoy in sermons on forgiveness or teachings on forgiveness are five or six st- steps on how to forgive and will vigorously write down what those steps are. Now, that can be good, but what I'm giving here is better 
And this is actually how we'll be able to forgive and sustain a forgiveness is to gaze on God's glory. Verse 55, but being full of the Holy Spirit, he gazed intently into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. In verse 56, and then he goes on to tell the people that are there that, behold, I see the heavens opened up and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. So he's gazing up, he sees Jesus standing, and then he passes it on and says, this is what I'm seeing right now, as if to say, you need to know today that even though you're coming against me, Jesus is on my side. Jesus is for me. He was full of the Holy Spirit. To forgive people who are mad at us and who are difficult calls for the same thing that Stephen did. He was full of the Holy Spirit. To be full of the Holy Spirit is not something for some elite Christians. It's for every person that knows Jesus to have the Holy Spirit of God. To be full of the Holy Spirit means to be emptied of our flesh, emptied of our pride, empty of our self-sufficiency and instead full of a yielding to and a dependence on the Holy Spirit of God. Forgiveness is supernatural. We will not be able to forgive the deepest hurts against us just in our own selves. It starts with being full of the Holy Spirit, led by the Spirit of God. You have all this mob and commotion around him. In Acts chapter 6, verse 15, when this council was first coming against Stephen, it says they fixed their gaze on him. So they're looking at him. They're about to interrogate him. They're bringing false testimony against him. They're lying about him, and they are aimed at him. Now, I have no doubt that when he was talking about God's story, that he was looking at them sharing that story. But when it comes down to their response to him, he's not looking at them anymore. They fixed their gaze on him. He took his gaze off of them and he took it into the heavens. And the way we'll be able to forgive those who are really difficult to forgive is to get our eyes off of them and to get our gaze Onto Jesus. When our gaze is on him, Paul writes that in Colossians 3 2. He says to set our minds on the things above, not on the things that are on earth. The way we forgive is to relax ourselves into God's glory, to keep our gaze on him. And what he saw, what he gazed on, was the glory of God, the radiance of God, the splendor of God. And Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Mostly what we see in the scripture is Jesus sitting at the right hand of God. Here, Jesus is standing at the right hand of God. There's been a lot of speculation. Why was Jesus standing? Why, Why when Stephen looked into the heavens, and God was letting him see his glory and see Jesus while he's standing. And it seems to be the idea of he's about to welcome home the first martyr. This will be the first one to lose his life for the faith of following Jesus. It would be like if I invited you to my home, if I were sitting at the table near the door, and you come to the door and knock or ring the doorbell or, or whatever you would do or text me and tell me you're there, uh, I wouldn't just stay seated and say, hey, come on in. I would stand up, I would go to the door, and to honor you as a guest, I would invite you in, but I would have stood for you to bring you in, to welcome you into our home. And Jesus is advocating for and welcoming in Stephen, giving him a confidence here in these moments that that you are coming home soon and I am welcoming you to your heavenly home. The writer of Hebrews gives this same idea, verses 1 through 3. says, therefore, since we have so great a cloud of witnesses surrounding us, Let us also lay aside every encumbrance and the sin which so easily entangles us. Let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. How do we do that? 
fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and now he sat at the right hand of the throne of God. Fixing our eyes on Jesus. So we, we gaze. We can do the same thing Stephen's done where we're gazing intently on Jesus. We do that by fixating ourselves in the scriptures. We do that by thinking about who we know Jesus is. We look up into the heavens and we fixate on Jesus. It's gazing intently on Jesus. It's fixing our eyes on Jesus. Again, I can give you every tip in the world on forgiveness. I'll actually give you a few at the end. But the reality is, When we gaze on Jesus, immerse ourselves in the Word of God, lean into the Holy Spirit of God, that's how we'll be able to forgive and release those who've hurt us. It's a fixation with Jesus Christ Himself. Now, if you like to memorize Scripture, there are a number of plans out there and cards that people do. In Hebrews 12, 1 and 2, if somebody gives a plan, usually will be included in the plan. I memorized that years ago, verses 1 and 2. And I can't remember if I heard a sermon on it or if I was studying it. I can't remember why, but I looked at verse 3 and thought, I've missed out by not putting verse 3 closely attached to 1 and 2. Because verse 3 says, Consider him who endured such hostility by sinners against himself, so that you may not grow weary and lose heart. Gaze on Jesus at the cross and consider the hostility against him. And there is no hostility that you and I will ever face that is as great as the hostility that Jesus faced in going to the cross. So we continue to remind ourselves, fix ourselves on, fixate ourselves on what happened to Jesus. And that actually enables us to continue to do good and to forgive and to release people who are difficult. It's gazing in his word, on the spirit, the cross. And I also believe it's gazing into the outdoors and the creation that God has designed. This past week, the wedding I did was a destination wedding in Colorado. And uh, it's a third destination wedding I've done. I just want to cheer you on. Destination weddings are fun. Um, and I'm, I'm available. I can arrange my schedule, uh, whatever you need. Uh, but the wedding was 11,000 feet up and just spectacular scenery of God's creation. And then we had to take a gondola down. Uh, it was a gondola up and a gondola down, but we went down around midnight and the stars were just majestic. And I couldn't take my eyes off looking out of the gondola, looking at the stars. I just kept looking up. And then e-bikes are fun until they're not. Lisa and I rode e-bikes up to Maroon Bells. And while we were there, we sat by a river. And, and when we were by the river, I read Psalm 104. And I would just cheer you on that anytime you're out in God's creation in the mountains, hover in Psalm 104 because the psalmist is writing about what you're in in those moments. And I was dwelling on that and I was coming down the road off the mountain and I was just thinking about uh, what I'd read and just got immersed in praise of God as I was biking down that mountain, that road. I actually felt like the dog I saw this morning uh, coming to come to the first service. Come down 26, and and there's a car in front of me with a moonroof, sunroof, whatever you want to call it. And, and then the dog, it's like a big Weimaraner's head just kind of pops out. And, and the dog's just looking straight ahead. His ears are going back. The wind's got hold of it. I'm like that dog. I love the wind. Uh, and, and I love sticking my head out of a car. And I loved riding a bike down this mountain road. And I started thinking about Psalm 104 and what what God says in there. And he says that I'm looking at the clouds and I'm seeing, okay, God, this is your chariot. The clouds are, and the winds are your messengers as they come towards me. And the mountains you caused to rise up and the valleys you caused to sink and the rivers you made to flow. And I just enjoyed being in the safety of God's majesty in his creation. 
And we're always safe in Christ and in the bigness of God. No matter what else happens outside of that, we're safe in Him. And when I know I'm safe in Christ, I'm free to forgive the most difficult of people. So how do we forgive difficult people? We gaze on God's glory. We have a little back and forth going here in the, in the dialogue in Acts 7. We want to gaze on God's glory, not glance, gaze, immerse, gaze. And it will enable us to forgive those who are our enemies, in verses 57 and 58. But they cried out with a loud voice, and they covered their ears and rushed at him with one impulse. Somebody wrote to me in thinking about this verse and said, it's almost like they were a bunch of kindergartners, and, and they'd just been told they couldn't go to recess. It's like, oh, no, don't tell me I can't go to recess. And, and so they're, they're fuming mad at him. They cover their ears, and they rush at him. This is mob mentality right here, and, and they are coming at him. And when they'd driven him out of the city, they began stoning him, and the witnesses laid aside their robes at the feet of a young man named Saul. It's our first introduction to Saul, whose name would later change after a conversion with Christ. If you're one of the most prolific followers of Jesus that we know, but not yet. When someone was stoned formally uh, in the way that they had set up in those days, they would be taken out of the city, their clothes would be stripped off of them, they'd be thrown off the side of a cliff about 10 or 12 feet, And then a stone would be rolled off onto the person. If that didn't kill them, then another stone would be rolled until it did. This was not that kind of stoning. This was an impulsive one. And rather than Stephen's clothes being taken off, the ones who were doing the stoning, it says, laid aside their robes. They took their clothes off as if they needed plenty of of, uh, throwing room to stone him. So he's facing these enemies. Who, who are our enemies today? I gave you a broad sweep of those who are mad at us. Those who are mad at us and our enemies could be one and the same. I, I think there are a tremendous amount of good things that happen on social media. I think there's a lot of influential things that go on for the sake of Christ and, and just good things. And, and then there's also those things that are Negative. And the social media influencers out there that are actively opposed to God. We might see enemies today as politicians and what their particular policies are. We might see enemies today as our spouse or our ex spouse. Our enemies might be our kids. Our adult children who've rejected faith. And now they're actively opposed to us and our faith. Maybe that's the case. It could be like King David. One of his closest friends betrayed him. You might have had a friend betray you and you've had trouble forgiving them. It's kind of like, where did that come from? There's people out there that are nameless to us that are enemies as well. This week, we have something to celebrate with the overturning of Roe v. Wade and the courage uh, of those, yeah. As a Christian, we celebrate that because we understand that God is a God of life in the womb all the way to death. And as our friend Rollin Warren, who we brought in Memorial Day weekend to talk about this issue because we anticipated this ruling, uh, think pro-abundant life is the way he talked about it. I thought that was really good. Read an excerpt Tony Evans wrote, and he talked about whole life. Uh, So we're just thinking life 
And so that, that's exciting uh, to us. Uh, I've read a number of things over the last few days and watched the news last night. That's always encouraging uh, as a norm. <laughs> and it's, it's interesting. You know, who, who are our enemies as Christians right now? Because it's, it's like this is our fault that, that this has occurred. And after 50 years, the global community is saying, we've just set back the whole globe. I'm glad we still have that much influence across the globe. (laughs) That this decision would set the whole globe back. Or I watch protesters and watch women screaming, my body, my choice. And I... As a Christian, I was telling you as a Christian, I understand someone else might see this differently. It's not a Christian. I'm saying if you're a Christian, 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20 says, do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit and that you're not your own? You've been bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body. Our bodies are life-giving. So as a Christian, it's that, that's not even an accurate statement, my body. It's not my body. It's God's. I'm His. And then I listen to our president talk about how he's going to do everything he can with federal law to make sure that women have their rights to reproductive health. Which, just for clarity, they've been working for years on how to best use the wording so that it feels better. I know you know that. Or the Austin City Council member that said, I know that laws getting triggered in Texas that would ban abortion in this state. But we're just going to take the calls and then not act on them. Gosh, I'm so proud of that. Watching people beat on windows, scaring people half to death at the, cap- at the Capitol building. For some reason, that's okay today. And I wanted to call the news station because I watched this whole segment with all these things on it, and they interviewed one person that saw this as a good thing. And, and the lady did a beautiful job of describing why. But I thought, wow. I, I actually wanted to call the news station and say, what if y'all interviewed a counselor who's worked with women who have had abortions and get that counselor's perspective? Or how sad that over 50 years there's been a law that for some reason young girls believe this is okay because our government has legalized it. And I want to draw this as a comparison if I could. I come from a family where there's a lot of gambling and I know the devastation of what gambling does. Does anyone find it odd that we legalize gambling and immediately the billboards go up so you can call somebody when you're addicted? How how does legalize? Well, everybody does it, so we'll legalize it. That way we can at least make money. I, no, that's not protecting. How many young girls would have made different decisions if the law wasn't telling them this is okay? And, and as Christians, we have the deepest compassion on those who've had abortions. And, and God's forgiveness that we're talking about right now, it covers that. There's freedom. But, but when there's things like that and the, the enemies, how, how do we forgive people who are perpetuating these things that are against life? Well, we do it exactly the way Jesus said to do it. In Matthew chapter 5, verse 44. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. We love them and we pray for them. And and I just want to pause for a moment and do that. 
Because I, I would hope as Christians we build a habit that when we see things on the news, when we read things on social media, that we pause to pray. That we're not throwing stones. We're calling things what they are. But we pause to pray. And one of the things I pray for our president, by the way, and for political leaders, I pray for them that something will happen like happened with Nebuchadnezzar. King Nebuchadnezzar in the book of Daniel, he was prideful. He looked at everything he said and said, you know, look at all I built. God humbles him, kind of takes him out for a while. But there's a verse in there that just struck me one time. I thought, oh, wow. Nebuchadnezzar looked up. And when he looked up, his reason returned to him. See, people get irrational and deluded because they're not looking towards God. When we gaze into God's eyes, when we gaze into the scriptures, reason returns. And see, ultimately, a person is not our enemy. Satan is the enemy who deludes, blinds, lies, deceives, and attacks. People are not our enemy. Satan is. So we want to pray. So if we could, let's do that. Father, thank you for uh, the power of your word. Uh, and God, thank you for a, a lot of good news this week. And, and we just are appreciative of that. Uh, and then, Father, I pray uh, for those who are persecutors of you, those who are against life that you shape and you form. I pray, God, that you would change their hearts. And, and so many that have had changed hearts, God, I pray you continue to do that. And, and Lord, I pray that you would channel the decisions of politicians and that you would channel the decisions of businesses that are woke and that are uh, making sure that people are going to be able to travel to another state, which is a, quote, safe haven, which uh, is not safe for a child in the womb. But God, I pray for those that are making those decisions. Lord, would you disrupt their hearts in such a way that, that they see the beauty of Jesus and they see the beauty of life and, uh, and a, a holistic life. And, and then, God, I pray as we were challenged a few weeks ago that we would get in the mix of, of discipling and, and bringing people together and serving those who are uh, having babies and that we can be helpful when that baby enters into the world. Help us, God, to, as, a, as a church to be whole from in the womb all the way till death of giving dignity and life and serving and cheering each other on. And, and Father, I pray when people are in opposition to us, help us to love them back and help us to forgive and to serve while we seek justice in those things that are good and right. And so we thank you and pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, this is what Stephen did. He, he prayed. And I love what he did because he imitated the prayers of Jesus. Sometimes we don't know what to pray. We never go wrong when we pray the Scripture. And Stephen imitated the prayers of Jesus. Verse 59. They went on stoning Stephen as he called on the Lord and said, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Now think about that for a minute. He's being stoned. Like they're, they're throwing rocks at him and his eyes are not on them. His gaze is still on God and his prayer is to God and his focus is to Jesus. Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. This is the exact same thing that in Luke 23, 46, that Jesus said as he was hanging on the cross, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. See, the safety, as I mentioned earlier, is in Jesus. That's where we're safe. And, and here in the end, Stephen is yielding himself to Jesus. And then in verse 60, then falling on his knees, he cried out with a loud voice. So he wasn't weakened in his voice, it was with a loud voice so everybody could hear, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. And having said this, he fell asleep, meaning he went into the hands and arms of Jesus, who was standing and waiting for him. I would hope I ended life this well. Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And anyone that's wronging me, Father, don't hold that sin against them. Release and forgive them. 
It's the same thing Jesus said. Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. People don't know what they're doing. I had a friend that jumped in a parade a couple of years ago, or not a parade, a protest, and um, he just got in there to see if people even knew why they were protesting. And he started talking to people. He said, why are you doing this? Nobody seemed to know why they were doing it. How often does that happen with mobs? They don't even know that. Father, forgive. They don't know what they're doing. They're blinded by Satan. Stephen was courageous, resolute. He died beautifully. He imitated Jesus. He was full of the Spirit. We can forgive when we're full of the Spirit. Our hearts actually are revealed in moments like this. When when there's this kind of opposition, it actually reveals our heart. It reveals where we are in our relationship with Jesus. And will we respond like Jesus responded or will we respond in a way that's not like Jesus? In a June 15th article that Breakpoint uh, wrote, they talked about this in the title, Forgiveness is Not an Act of Weakness. I think this is really important to hear. So here's... I would say it's an immersion in Jesus, and here's a few tips to go with it. One is that forgiveness is not an act of weakness. And he said, forgiveness, gentleness, compassion are signs of weakness in some people's eyes. And then he goes on to say that forgiveness and reconciliation are different. I do think this is a crucial distinction. Okay, sometimes we don't want to forgive because we think forgiveness means I'm reconciling. Those are two separate things. It doesn't take, it takes two people to reconcile. The other person has to be willing. But you don't need two people to forgive. The forgiveness is between us and God towards that person to forgive them. And then in the article, he goes on to say, The reason I say these two things are different is we're not pretending that evil does not exist. Forgiveness is not acting like something's not wrong here. That's not what forgiveness is. He does say that forgiveness, uh, that it may involve asking forgiveness from ideological opponents. In other words, we might have the right view, but the way we've approached it towards our uh, different ideologues, we've done it in such a way, we actually need to seek forgiveness. What it does mean when we go the way of Christ in forgiveness is that we forgo vengeance. In Romans 12, 18, we're told, if possible, so far as it depends on you, be at peace with all men. The next verse says, vengeance is mine, says the Lord. Vengeance is not yours or mine to take. That's God's job. He's a God of justice. So it does involve forgoing vengeance while seeking justice and extending love to those who are extending hate. Now that is supernatural to be able to not take vengeance on those who've hurt us or someone we love while at the same time seek justice, because God is a God of justice, and love the person that we're seeking justice with and for, the person who might hate us. It's a strength that's rooted in Christ. Neil Anderson, in writing about forgiveness, says this, forgiveness is not forgetting. I think that's an important, sometimes we think if, Uh, I have to forget it. Some things are such that a Holocaust victim is not going to forget what happened. So if if forgiveness requires we forget, then we're already at a spot where it's almost impossible to do. So it's not forgetting. It is a willful decision helped by the Holy Spirit. It's from the heart, and it's not holding a sin against them. That's when we know we've forgiven, by the way. I think that's a good litmus test. I might remember the sin, but I don't hold it against them anymore. It might pop up, but I don't bring it up against them anymore. We've buried that.
He says don't wait until you feel like it. I think that's good advice because you might not ever feel like it. And then here's an interesting thought that when I read, I thought, I haven't thought about this in a while. When we forgive, we are agreeing to live with the consequences of another's sin. When we forgive, we're actually taking on the consequences of another person's sin. That's what Jesus did. In Ephesians 4.32, we're to be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving each other, just as God in Christ also forgave us. Those are good things to know about forgiveness. Ultimately, the reason I forgive you and you forgive me is because God has first forgiven me. And my sin is every bit as horrific as your sin. And if we can't come to a reckoning that our sin is horrific before God, then that will create a barrier in understanding forgiveness. The wedding I did the other night, it's a bunch of UT people. I knew my crowd, I laid low on my Aggie comments. It was nice that the Aggies beat UT in the College World Series just before the rehearsal dinner. I thought the timing was magnificent. But it was the coolest deal because I didn't know there were Christians at UT. Maybe a couple, I've thought, but (laughs) I mean, some amazing people I met. I'm kidding. I know there are Christians there. But the groom... He trusted Christ in 2020. I I felt like I was living in the disciples' early church for a few minutes. He had trusted Christ. Two of the guys in his wedding party uh, had just gotten right with the Lord. They knew the groom and that uh, he was struggling. And so these two guys took the groom to meet one of their pastors at their church because they knew this guy could talk to him about Jesus. It's kind of like Jesus called somebody, and then they went off and got their brother and said, hey, you need to come over here, and I'm, I'm going to get you to Jesus. Somehow we just need to get people to Jesus. If we're not comfortable with it, get them to somebody who is. And so there's these two guys. They brought the groom. Well, then another guy in his wedding party, the groom had led to Christ. This is all the last couple of years. Well, they wanted me to share the gospel, and so I, I mentioned that earlier. And so I laid it out, and I challenged them, and well, after the wedding and the reception, these three girls come up to me and they said, uh, just thank you for the way you shared the gospel. And I said, well, what's y'all's story? How are y'all connected here? Well, they started telling me, and they started telling me that they are in an organization called STUMO. It's a, uh, a ministry on college campuses. I said, really? I said, well, my son has a really good friend that uh, is a part of that. And they said, who? And I named him. Well, they knew him. They're actually being trained by him right now in Orlando. Well, they told me when they got to UT, none of them were Christians. And that first fall, there were girls on campus that immediately shared the gospel with them, and they trusted Jesus. And you can just see in their faces, I mean, they just lit up talking about how God saved them when they got on campus. That totally changed the trajectory of what their experience would have been at UT. But it was other people bold enough to talk about Christ with them. They received Christ. Now they've been sharing the gospel. They've led other girls to Christ. They're discipling them. And they're in Orlando, Florida right now going to the beaches uh, and sharing the gospel with people there. They just took a quick time out to come to the wedding and then head back. I say that to say that the only way we'll ever forgive like I've talked about today is to be like those three girls or like that groom or his two friends that brought him or the one that the groom led to Jesus. And somewhere first there has to be a receiving and a humbling ourselves to realize that my sins are horrific before God. Jesus Christ hung on a cross. He paid for my sin. He took on the debt of my sin so that I could be totally freed up. And when I receive that, I become a child of God and a follower of Jesus. And now that I have Christ in me, I meditate and think on what he did for me. And that's how I can forgive and release you. Do you know Jesus that way? I was at a wedding Monday night, a funeral on Friday morning, and I thought, what a contrast. You know, I'm at the beginning of something and I'm at the end of something both people that love Jesus. 
But I said this to all the crowds. I'll say it to us today. My concern in our culture is that we do all the church thing and somehow we've missed Jesus like Jesus has captured these young men I just described and these young ladies I just described. It's not always about this horrific looking sin someone needs to be rescued from. Oftentimes it's religion and self-righteousness and trusting our morals and our goodness we need to be rescued from because that's not good enough to get us to God. It's only the grace of God through Jesus Christ. Have you experienced that forgiveness? If so, then supernaturally we can forgive the most difficult of people. I want us to pray together and have a little bit of space here. And, and I don't know what God is doing in you or not in you. And, uh, but I wonder if some names have come to mind. Some groups of people out there, some ideologies that you, you might need to forgive. So your own heart doesn't get embittered. But whatever that is, I, I would do something like this. It's simple to me. It, it's... You know what, God, I'm so grateful that you've forgiven me for all the ugliness in my own heart and my own sin. And thank you for putting me under you at the cross and freeing me. Will you now help me to forgive so-and-so in the same way you've forgiven me? To release them and to not hold the sin against them. And you may have to do that multiple times. There's some that the things are so hurtful that we have to go back again and again and re-release the person or the group. But today can sure be freeing to enjoy the forgiveness we've received and then to extend and offer it. We'll break free in those moments and God will be glorified. Father, thank you uh, for the strength and power of your word. Thank you for Stephen for modeling for us how to forgive, uh, forgive well, to forgive our persecutors. And, uh, and God, help us not to be persecutors of other people. Help us to seek your justice, to extend your kindness and your, and your love, and to extend forgiveness, God, and that the forgiveness would so melt another's heart uh, that they could do nothing but receive you as well. And uh, so we just thank you that supernaturally by your spirit, this is possible today. Uh, so I pray freedom uh, for us as we forgive and that we'd be known uh, not as a harsh people, but as a forgiving and gracious people. And I pray that in Jesus name. Let, let's be quiet before the Lord. Amen.
As we wrap up our time today, I want to invite you uh, in uh, this afternoon, actually right after this service right now, uh, upstairs, we're going to have our membership class. If you uh, just want to learn a little bit more about who, who we are as a church, what we believe, uh, and then how we go about living out that belief, uh, we'd love to have, have you come uh, join this membership class. We're going to have you be serving lunch, and uh, and you'll learn a little bit more about that. Or if you're ready to become a member, this is the, the starting point to that, to make sure and go through and make sure we're aligned with what we believe, and then we kind of move forward from there on membership. So hopefully you can join us for that. Uh, as, we, uh, as we leave, we have the opportunity to continue our worship by leaving our tithes and offerings, uh, just like so many of you have been so faithful to do. You can also do, do that online. And then also, we're going to have a team of people right up here uh, that would love to pray with you. So if God has been stirring something, especially in the area of forgiveness or whatever he's stirring, uh, we'd love to pray with you uh, right after, as soon as, we, as soon as I say amen. So, um, and as we leave, uh, our prayer this week is just that uh, as we go about the week, that that we would be marked by our forgiveness of others. And the way we do that is by keeping our gaze on the glory of God all week long. So that is our prayer for you. You'll have a great week. Thank God.